Ephesians is just is a is a glorious book. It's a wonderful book, and it's not a personal letter like a lot of Paul's letters were. This is uh, commonly believed, and I believe this also that that the letter to the Ephesians was not meant to be a letter just strictly to the church at Ephesus, but that it was meant to be circulated from to other churches there in Asia. And as we go through, I think you'll see why. And, and that this letter is very, very clearly directed straight toward us. It's just as true for us uh, as it was for them. So uh, rather than like a personal letter, this is kind of a little bit more like a treatise. One of the great things about this is that this, not that the entire Bible doesn't do this, but in this letter, it just it brings glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and what else is, is better than that, than bringing glory to the Most High, the Most Holy One, the Most Beautiful, the Most Awesome, our Savior, our Lord, shining in heaven, returning to earth to get us someday. I'm so thankful for that. All right. Right away, I suspect, or at least I'm hoping, that you took a little bit of a step back when you saw my subtitle. <clears throat> Attaining the Stature of Christ. <laughs> Attaining the Stature of Christ? You're not going all Kenneth Copeland on this, are you? No, if you... If you saw that, if you reacted the way I think that you might have, you probably thought something, and rightfully so, like this. We can't attain the stature of Christ. He's God and I'm not, right? Of course right, okay? So uh, you would have rightfully thought so. And uh, my reference to Mr. Copeland there is that he teaches that we can eventually become completely on par with Jesus, and that he himself is almost there now. As a matter of fact, he even claims to be able to control the weather. He needs to get started if he, if he can. <laughs> if he can. Uh, so if that's what you think I meant, you would be right to be alarmed. However, before we completely do away with that title, we need to look at a special verse which I believe is kind of like the high point of this letter. It's chapter 4, verse 13. It says, Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So in some way, this title is correct. Either this verse is wrong or we don't really understand what it's saying, right? Right? Because here clearly it says, it's indicating that in some way, the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ is something for us. So we know it doesn't mean becoming on par with him. What does it mean? Well, uh, you'll be happy to know that I'm not going to explain that today. Because the whole book explains that. And so... If the Lord allows me to go all the way through this book, it's going to take several weeks for us to finish that. And um, I, I believe that it will be a blessing to you. So what I'm going to do today, and usually when I start a book study, I give a lot of background information. I'm going, only going to give just, well, practically none of that today. I'm kind of going to spread it out uh, over several weeks' time. But what I want to give you is I want to give you what I would consider to be like a, a map of the book of Ephesians, and we're going to look at four different passages from the book to see how they fit in with that, with that plan. I, I realize that probably doesn't sound all that interesting, but I think that it will be uh, very profitable for us, and this message is going to stand alone. There are some very penetrating questions that even this general overview is going to ask us this morning. So, Ephesians 4.13, 4, I consider it to be like the high point of the book because, because everything before Ephesians 4.13 is kind of leading up to that point. And then after 4.13, everything is kind of like explaining or going into detail or shall we say unpacking details of what uh, 4.13 is actually saying to us. So this is like a picture of the book. 
Now, don't get me wrong. This is not intended to be a picture of the Christian life. The Christian life would look more like this. Lots of ups and downs and ups and downs, you know. Uh, it's, uh, like Mark Lowry used to say, you know, life is full of ups and downs, but Jesus came that we'd have more abundant life, right? <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, ups and downs, but the general trend over a lifetime uh, is upward. So, so this is not the map of the Christian life. This is a map of the book of Ephesians, okay? And so I'll, I'll show you how all of that's going to work. So, so here's the high point. Now, to start with, we're going we're gonna to start at the most logical place to start any book, right? The end. Don't you, all, don't you all read the last chapter before you read the rest of the book? That way you don't have to worry while you're in the middle of the book what's going to happen to the main character. You'll know it turns out all right. <laughs> you know, that's what we do with the Word, isn't it? We read the end and find out we win. So, so firstly, in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 14, it tells us, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And I'm going to stop reading there. There are more pieces of armor that are listed in that passage, but I'm not intending to talk about the pieces of the armor today. What I wanted you to see from this today is that, it, is that there is a, a thought that he repeats four different times in that. The words stand firm. How many times did we count the words stand firm in those verses? We counted them three times in five verses. Plus, there was the word resist, which is not the same word, not even in Greek, but it is something that is contextually of the same meaning. So, uh, so four times in five verses, we are instructed, stand firm, stand firm, resist. Stand firm. You know, sports fans are familiar with the phrase, the best offense is a good defense. And there have been a lot of teams in various sports whose whole strategy was to be so offensive-minded that they score so many points that the other team just can't keep up. You know, who cares if the other team scores 50 points if we score 51? And a lot of teams have won a lot of games that way. Another sports cliche that you've probably heard before is offense wins games, but defense wins championships. And if you look back over the history, you will find out that most of the time, it's the team with the better defense that wins. This year's Super Bowl was a prime example of that. Denver Broncos, they have one of the greatest, if not the greatest, quarterbacks of all times. And John, I know you're choking back there, and I'm not dissing Brady, don't worry. I'm not dissing Brady. It's just that Peyton's my personal favorite. And so since he's my personal favorite, then, then that makes him the greatest. Now, truly, he is one of the greatest, and, and nobody really argues with that, as long as we have the one of the in front of that. Amazing arm. But the reason I like him so much is he has an amazing football mind. It's just incredible. But you know what? Peyton Manning did not win the Super Bowl this year. For him, that game was mediocre. It was Denver's defense that won that game. This passage describes a Christian with a great defense. Defense wins. You notice that this passage does not talk about storming the gates of hell, uh, taking away Satan's ground, or plucking souls out of the enemy's grasp. 
Now, there are passages in the Bible that do talk about those things, but this is not one of them. This passage is speaking of spiritual warfare in the sense that Satan is attacking us and we are defending. We are fending him off. Now, I've said this before, just remember, when I use the name Satan here, I'm using it generically uh, because the Bible teaches us that Satan can only be in one place at one time. He's not omnipresent like God is. And so most of the time when we experience satanic attack, we're actually experiencing it from demons and not Satan himself. And so I'm just going to use the word Satan to represent all of that, and you kind of remember that without uh, having to say that. And without uh, going into a whole lot of detail here, um, let's just say that for some reason, God wanted us to be involved in our own defense. Now, the thing that gets me is that God could flip Satan away just like a paper wad if he wanted to. Just, just a little, and, and, and he's gone. And wouldn't it really be better for us if he did that? Wouldn't it be easier and better for our lives as Christians if God would just take Satan out of the way? Well, apparently not. Since he hasn't done it, apparently not. God allows Satan a little bit of leash room. A little bit of leash room. I think that we don't know just how tight of a leash that God keeps on Satan because we're, a lot of times, I don't think we're aware of the, the intensity and the frequency of the attack that we receive from demons. See, one of their best things is, is to be under the cover of, of camouflage. And if we don't recognize and that this is what's happening, that we're actually being attacked by an evil spirit in our thinking or whatever, then uh, we might not do the right warfare to battle against that. Okay? So... I read recently that, and I don't remember the exact number, but the, av the average number of attacks uh, from hackers or, or from viruses online on a computer in a, in a given year is in the tens of thousands. And most of those, if you have a decent security software on your computer, most of those you don't ever even know about. And every once in a while, if you go to a website and it's harmful, it'll flash up a warning for you and you'll see it. Uh, but most of those you don't know about. And I really believe that most of the times that the enemy tries to attack us, that we're not even aware of it. The issue is the times that we are aware, because that's still a lot. And Satan does not cause everything that happens in your life. But Satan wants to use anything in your life to try to attack your faith. He can use hard times to attack your faith, and he can also use good times to attack your faith. He can use poverty. He can use prosperity. Either way, he can use it. His whole goal is to attack your faith. And if, if Satan cannot somehow convince you to break the rules, then what he'll do is he'll encourage you to keep the rules, only to do it with a self-righteous attitude, as though in your own strength you're doing it. So his attack is frontal, and it is constant, and it is intense, but God wants us to be involved in our own defense, and so he says, stand firm. Have a good defense. And that's why all the weapons except for one in the list of the armor are all defensive weapons. You know, helmet, breastplate, belt, shield, Sword of the Spirit is the only one that could be even considered an offensive weapon. So, so God wants us to be Christians of great defense. He wants us in some way to be able to stand strong against the attack of Satan. So let's put this one on our timeline of the book of Ephesians there towards the end. And that would indicate for us that this passage is 
some explanation about how 413 attaining to the stature of Christ is, is one way that it's played out in our lives. Let's look at another passage. I'm going to look at four altogether. So the second one is Ephesians 5, 17 through 18. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. Now that word dissipation, the, if you took the Greek word and, and just translated it in as raw a form as you can, as literally as you can, would mean unsavedness. Unsavedness. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is unsavedness, but be filled with the Spirit. All right? So, we are to be filled with the Spirit. When Paul told us that, he gave us a command. He gave us a command. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, is that not counterintuitive to the way we normally think of being filled with the Spirit? Because normally we think of it as being that we are completely passive and the Spirit moves on us. Kind of like the way he did in Acts chapter 2 when they were all gathered together. You know, they didn't do anything to bring the Holy Spirit upon them except wait. They were not in control of when he came. They were not in control of how he came. And they were not in control when he came of themselves. But in this passage, Paul, a person who the Bible frequently speaks of being filled with the Holy Spirit, is giving us a directive. You, you be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so somehow, he wants us to be actively involved, somehow being filled with the Spirit partially, not fully, but partially, is something that we do. Again, if we put this on the timeline, we see that, again, that that is, since it's after 4.13, then it is another way in which the concept in 4.13 is being worked out through us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Now, um, I said that Ephesians 4.13 was the high point of the book, but I think that the two greatest words in this book are the first two words of this verse, but God. <laughs> because before that, he's talking about uh, where we are, we're dead in our trespass, so forth. But, but God, and that changes everything. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. All right, so let me just ask you some questions, and I want you to try to give me an answer to these questions based on what it says in those two verses. So let's read them again so you can remember. Maybe you have your Bible open. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. So, uh, as you answer these, I don't want you to think about it too much. I don't want you to put it in your own words. I don't want you to think, well, what could the answer possibly be? I just want you to answer the question based on what you just read in the passage. All right, it's just a simple question, no discussion. <laughs> just a simple fill in the blank, just like you would with a multiple choice test, only you have to look at the text to get the answer. Okay, question number one. What did God do to us? Look at your, look at your word, look at your Bibles. He made us alive. Okay, he made us alive. Why did God have to make us alive? Because we were dead. When did God make us alive? When we were dead. That's when he made us alive. I just knew somebody was going to come up and, uh, and say, uh, well, he, he made us alive when we received Christ. That would be true. <laughs> that would be true, but that's not what this verse says. When did God make us alive? When we were dead. And then, why did God make us alive? Love. 
mercy. Rich in mercy because of his great love toward us. Okay, so now, uh, before I talk about why I did it that way, I want you to think about this. This is very simple. It was just simple answers, not simple to comprehend, but simple to just answer with words. Um, and you think about this. God made me alive when I was dead. That's when he did it. God made me alive because I was dead. God made me alive because of his great love. When did he make me alive? He made me alive when I was dead. God did an action on a dead man and made that man alive. Now, like I said, it's not simple to comprehend, is it? Is that not an amazing statement? God made a dead person be alive. I didn't have any part in making myself alive. I had a response of faith, receiving Christ, but I did not make myself alive. Just a little sidebar, and that is, if you've ever wondered why you have some trouble studying the Bible, a lot of times it may be because you missed step one of, of Bible studying. And that is to answer this question, what does it say? So often, we tend to jump immediately to what does it mean? But before you can ever answer the question, what does it mean? You have to answer the question, what does it say? And that's just exactly what we did. It's the simplest part but it's very important. Okay, now to put that on our timeline, this is before 413, and so uh, this is in the earlier part, and so if we're talking about driving to Ephesians 413, we have to drive through that town, through God making us alive. Okay, let's look at one more passage. This is chapter 2, verses 19 through 22. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Now, I had a really good friend once who, uh, after I'd preached a, a sermon on this, uh, I think I also brought in uh, something that Peter says about our being living stones in the temple of God. And so what that means is that every Christian, every single Christian, is like a stone in the building that God's building. Okay? And, um, you know, uh, the old-time stonemasons, they didn't uh, have all this prefab stuff. They had stones. And so when they were building their wall... A lot of times they would have to look for a, a, the best stone in order to be able to fit it into this spot with the least amount of chipping. And so my friend, after I, after I talked about this, he comes up and he says, you know, that makes me feel really happy because I often see myself as being an oddball. I am so glad that God has oddball-shaped spaces in his wall. <laughs> He creates a stone to fit the place. Okay, again, without going into much detail, we need each other in order to become everything we can be, right? Christianity is not a Lone Ranger thing. That's a hard lesson for me because I'm more of an introvert. I, am, I would be a Lone Ranger if God's work in my life did not pull me out of that because that's my nature but we need each other and so as we drive toward this point of Ephesians 413 we have to drive through this town too the town of mutual mutual relationships in the body of Christ not exclusive of each other for our maturity all right. So what does this do for us today? We've, we've kind of gotten just a little bit of a picture of what the book is going to look like. 
we'll go into a lot more detail, but besides giving a very brief and simple introduction to this letter, uh, I want us to just kind of let this message stand alone. We, the best thing that we can do here is just to take the verses that we've looked at, ask ourselves these penetrating questions so that, we, that, that this message can apply to our lives. Now, I want you to go out of here knowing this information, but I really want you going out of here thinking, this is something that applies to me. This is something that is in my life or maybe God's wanting to change something in your life. So let's just go through those points again, and, and let's ask them personally. Our journey toward the fullness of the stature of Christ involves being made alive, being born again. In church talk, getting saved. In plain English, that means asking God to forgive you of your sins and receive Jesus Christ as, the, as your personal Lord for the rest of your life, believing not only that He exists, but that He lived on the earth, died on the cross, and rose again from the dead. That's the essentials. That's salvation. Amen. You can only do that when the Holy Spirit is drawing you. So if he's drawing you, what does that mean? It means now's the time. How do I know if he's drawing me? Well, if there's this something inside of you that's, that's giving you this kind of a little queasy feeling apart from breakfast this morning, but something that's just, you're hearing these words and you're saying, oh my, this kind of sounds like me, then Holy Spirit's probably calling you. Scripture says when that happens that now is the time to respond to him. Now is the time to say yes to the free offer of salvation. Our journey towards the uh, mark of Ephesians 4.13 also took us through 2.19-22 through 22, which told us that we need each other. We're all part of the building of God. We're all part of that structure. We cannot achieve our full potential alone. So if we're driving to that town... Ephesians 4.13, we must first drive through that town, right? You don't reach your destination without going through that, that area in your life. Okay, then when we went on to speaking of being filled with the Holy Spirit, now I did not explain that very thoroughly at all, simply because it's going to take a whole message to do that. So you might not know if you're being filled with the Holy Spirit or not, but I can ask you this, and these are all relevant questions to that. Are you pursuing Christ with all your might? Are you pursuing the knowledge of Him? Are you, in, are, are you a praying Christian? Are you a Bible reading Christian? Are you filling your mind with His Word? Are you memorizing? Are you, do you sing worship songs in the shower? <laughs> I am half serious when I say that. You'll understand why when we get to the passage. But are you pursuing that? Is that something you want in your life? And then finally, the last passage we looked at, the stand firm passage. Stand firm against the attacks of the enemy. How are, how's your season record? Do you have a good defense? Or do you have a tendency to fall whenever the, the attack mounts? Stand firm be strong. That's part of arriving at the full stature of Christ. Okay. Before I close, I want to clear up a misconception that I may have caused. Neither I nor anyone else that I know or anyone else that I, I believe has ever existed has attained the full stature of Christ. So if I gave you that idea, I'm taking that idea back now. Okay? So, even the Apostle Paul did not make that claim. E even he said, not that I have already attained it. 
So, is this then more like something like Paul is just putting us, giving us the, the impossible dream? Yeah, that's a good, is he setting us up for failure? It's a good, good way to ask that. Well, if I take a drive to Roaring River, I can, I can drive up there, and when I get there, I can quit driving, right? Because I've arrived. I'm there. But in my drive to a Christian that is of the full stature of Christ, are we saying that we just drive and drive and drive and drive and drive, but we never get there? That doesn't sound all that appealing, does it? So the way I think that, that we should understand this is that as we drive, we get to a higher plateau. And if you want to get out of the car and look at the view, go ahead. Enjoy it. Rejoice in it. And then sometime, then there's going to be another climb and another plateau, and then another climb, and another plateau. And so it's not an endless disappointment of not making it to the goal. It is an achieving of step after step after step, knowing, number one, thank you, God, for bringing me this far. Amen. Number two, thank you, God, for what lies ahead. And if you die before you believe that you have reached the mark, guess what? Don't worry about it because you have all of eternity to keep on going. You do. I don't think that when we get to, to eternity, when we get to heaven, that we're just going to be all, mm, you know, the whole time. I think we're going to be exploring and learning and growing and discovering things that God about God and that God has done. And so uh, we, we can keep on going forever. So, we drive. There's an old hymn that I think correctly describes this situation. Now, we've never done this hymn here in, in our church. We might do this in a week or two. But the hymn is called Higher Ground. Let me read it, some of it to you. I'm, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound this song of saints on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found, Lord, lead me on to higher ground. And the chorus goes, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher place than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. That, I believe, is how it works. And I believe that that's how the book of Ephesians is going to take us, step by step, to higher ground. Father, I just thank you for the way that you...